Hey everyone, hope you're all doing well. In this video, I'm going to be talking about how to discern sound doctrine. Now, this is a very important topic. We're going to be doing, you know, a word study on that word doctrine to show what the Bible teaches about it and, you know, things of that nature because this is absolutely essential. If you are not able to discern sound doctrine, you are putting your soul in jeopardy. You need to realize, guys, that your soul is dependent upon sound doctrine. And this is very clear as we get through this, you know, video and you'll see what I mean. But, for example, if you believe a lie and you base your salvation upon that lie, the Bible says you will deceive yourself and you will be tossed into the lake of fire because God will not have mercy on people who don't have a love for the truth. And only a genuine love for the truth will deliver you from any lie or heresy or false doctrine. Because if you don't have a love for the truth, the Bible says in Thessalonians that you will be turned over to a strong delusion. You'll be given over to it because you had not a love for the truth. So, you need to be aware of that. Because if you believe a lie, you believe in a false religious belief system, false doctrine you are in very serious danger. You need to be aware of that. Many people just don't think about it. They don't really pay attention to how serious it is. Because if your doctrine is wrong and you have bad, you know, bad doctrine, it's going to lead to bad conduct, bad practices, and it's going to lead people astray. And if the blind lead the blind, then both will fall into the ditch. So hopefully this video will be helpful in regards to giving you a better understanding of what doctrine is and what it does. People have this, you know, idea that doctrine is just head knowledge. You know, you just have head knowledge of information. But it goes much further than that, as we'll see when we start getting into the scriptures. So I want to start with Hosea chapter 4 verse 6. You know, most people will just quote the first part of this scripture, which says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Now, I'm going to read the rest of the scripture because I feel it's important to do so in this instance. But notice that God did not stop his people from being destroyed. He allowed them to be destroyed for a lack of knowledge. It goes on to say, Because thou hast rejected knowledge. This shows us that knowledge was given to them. And they had the ability to retain it, to accept it, but instead they rejected it. God gave them resources. He sent them people to speak on his behalf, yet they rejected knowledge. And it says, because of that, God will also reject thee. It says, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. That's a very serious statement. In the New Testament, every born-again Christian is a priest, and Jesus is our high priest. It says, Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. That's very serious. It's very serious. Even in Proverbs, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. What is instruction? It's somebody presenting information in order to help you do something better to correct you you know all scripture is given by inspiration of God for doctrine for instruction in righteousness if you reject the Word of God you you reject God's instructions you will be rejected by God that's very serious 2 Timothy 4 3 goes on to say for the time will come and I believe that time is now when they will not endure sound doctrine. That phrase, sound doctrine, literally means to be without any mixture of error. But after their own lusts, now notice, we see this today. Many people, instead of submitting to the Bible and, you know, changing themselves in accordance with the Bible, they will instead change the Bible and what it says in order to make it fit themselves and their belief systems, their emotions, 
you know, I don't think that's what God meant, so I'm going to change what he said to make it fit what I think he said. And this is very dangerous. It says, after their own lusts, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. People will only listen to people who tell them what they want to hear unless they have a genuine love for the truth. It's the only hope you have is if you genuinely love the truth, God will guide you into all truth by the spirit of truth. You understand? So you need to realize that, but we are going to be surrounded by Christians who after their own lust, will they not only heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, but they will also further perpetuate false doctrines that conform to their emotions and their belief systems. You know, the Bible says a woman can't be a pastor. Some women will say, well, I don't care what the Bible says. My pastor is a woman and she's a mighty woman of God. I've heard these things before. So what they do is they reject the Bible they reject what God said. They twist it to make it say something else. And that's all there is to it. And they will be destroyed for that. You understand? Moving on to Deuteronomy 32 verse 2. I bring this scripture up because it's the first scripture where the word doctrine shows up. This is the first instance of the word doctrine in the Bible. If you're familiar with hermeneutics, this is known as the law of first mention where you go to the first place the word shows up in scripture to get an understanding of the word and how it's used, what it what it means in a, according to the context and stuff like that. But Deuteronomy 32 verse 2 says, My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distu, distill as the dew, as the, smell, as the small rain upon the tender herb and as the showers upon the grass. Says, My doctrine shall drop as the rain. I found that interesting because what does rain do? When it rains on, you know, seeds that are in the field, what happens to the seeds? They grow. So right here, God's doctrine will help you grow is what I get from this. It says, my doctrine shall drop as the rain. Rain brings forth crops, which brings forth fruit, right? No rain, no crops. No crops, no fruit. So you have to literally be rooted in sound doctrine in order to grow. If you're not growing spiritually, it might be, be because you're not staying in the word. You understand? Jesus said, you know, out of your belly will flow, you know, rivers of living water. I believe that's, you know, in reference to the Holy Spirit. And rain can also be a type of the Holy Spirit. And just like in the New Testament, oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit and the parable of the ten virgins and stuff like that. But, you know, that's just, you know, what I feel it's saying. But it's very interesting to see that. Now, if we continue to read in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 2, it says, For I give you good doctrine. Good doctrine comes from God. You can't put all your trust in man. The Bible says, Cursed is the man that trusteth in man. You understand? Don't put your confidence in man. Yes, God sends men to help others. You know what I mean? In, in Ephesians, Jesus gives teachers and, and apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors to perfect the saints. But your job is also to make sure that they're in line with Scripture. You are also to seek the Lord yourself in your own private time. So it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And then there's another in instance in, uh, I think it's Jeremiah, where it talks about, Cursed is the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm. You understand? So it's very important to realize that good doctrine, the source of it, is God by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of truth, Jesus says. Moving on to Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 8. I just wanted to read this scripture because it shows something. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. In this Christian realm, we, there will always be doctrine of vanities. Many preachers teach this. You turn on the TV, you got televangelists preaching doctrine of vanities. What that mean is 
empty words, meaningless words. And they disguise it under Christian terminology. And they use the same words that are in the Bible, but it's empty. It's void of any truth. It's void of any spiritual substance. You know what I mean? It will appeal to your emotions, to your soul. It will appeal to your lust. You understand? But you have to be careful and know the scriptures yourself so that you can see whether or not what they're saying is true. Just like it says in the book of Acts, in reference to the Bereans, they were considered noble because they would go back and check what the apostles were saying with the scriptures. And that was a noble thing. And it's still a noble thing if you were checking what I'm saying or what anybody else is saying with the scripture. It's very important because we have an abundance of doctrine of vanities coming from people all over YouTube, all over Facebook, all these self-professing prophets, people calling themselves apostles, calling themselves things that they're not. And it's vanity. It's empty. It's foolish. It's worthless. And you have to be aware of that and know that if you're going to be able to discern sound doctrine. You understand? You have to be able to see if something's vanity or if it's of spiritual substance. See, going back to Deuteronomy 32, 2, my doctrine shall drop as the rain. If the doctrine you're getting is not producing good fruit in you to where you're changing for the better, you're turning from sin, you're becoming more Christ-like, you're becoming more full of the Holy Spirit, you're getting closer to the Lord. That's good doctrine. But if you're listening to doctrine of vanities, which is just making you feel good, but it's producing no real change in your life, you're getting no real revelation from God, you're not growing in knowledge and wisdom and understanding, then there's a problem. You have to be able to distinguish between the two if you are to be able to discern sound doctrine. You have to look at what it's producing in you, how it's affecting you. Because you need to grow. You need to be conformed to the image of Christ. And if somebody's feeding you doctrine that's not doing that, then you might want to stop listening to that doctrine. You see what I'm saying? So, we go on to Matthew chapter 7, verse 28 and 29. This is after Jesus gave his Sermon on the Mount. It says, And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. Now, that phrase is in the New Testament, in the Gospels, several times, where the people were astonished at his doctrine. They were taken back and shocked because he spoke with power and authority. It goes on to say, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So notice when the people heard Jesus preach and give his sermon, they were astonished and then they compared it to what they're used to hearing, which was from the scribes and Pharisees, which was just monotone, I'm assuming. It was just dead, spiritually dead. It was probably doctrine of vanities. And when somebody came along and gave them the real truth, they were astonished. That's, that's good. I mean, that's amazing. And it goes on to say in Luke 4.32, And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. What does Paul say? The kingdom of God is not in word only, but in power. People need to come speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit. Just because somebody uses a lot of big words, a lot of theological terms that they got from seminary and a bunch of man-made man terminology and all these things, that is not powerful. What is powerful is when somebody is speaking under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, giving you real revelation that impacts your walk with God. Because if you're listening, listening to somebody and you're just saying, wow, they sound so good, praise God, amen, he expounds the word so great, and you go back to your spiritually dead state, you are deceiving yourself and you're being deceived by somebody who has no power and no real authority from God. You need to be able to recognize this stuff. I seen somebody the other day posting uh, on social media about how, you know, they just love how 
you know, John MacArthur articulates his his sermons and his words, and he, he's able to expound the scripture so well. And it's just pathetic because this man is a hyper-Calvinist, once saved, always saved. You can take the mark of the beast and still be saved. The gifts have ceased. And all these doctrines of devils, and people are impressed by him. I don't even think that man has the Holy Spirit. And he is impressing people and making people think he's some great man of God. That is scary to me. That is scary. I don't even need to listen to a word that John MacArthur speaks in order for me to grow in Christ. You understand? You, you need to grow in Christ because you need to hunger and thirst after righteousness yourself. Not just because somebody can sound smart and you feel good because they gave you a little understanding of some passages in Scripture. Most of the time they're perverting Scripture and giving it a meaning it wasn't meant to have. You need to realize that, guys. So, you just need to be able to discern. Again, it's so important. We go on to Matthew 16, verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So right here, Jesus is giving a warning to his disciples, saying, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. They were confused at this at first, and then it goes down in verse 12 to say, you know, that Jesus was talking about their doctrine. Beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were the mainstream religion of that time. They were the main, you know, proponents viewed as God's messengers. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were the pastors and leaders. People went to them with their questions. And Jesus said, beware of their doctrine. You need to understand, guys, that this same thing is happening today. Just because multitudes of people are trusting in a man for the word of God doesn't mean that they're a true man of God. You have to beware of the leaven. You have to beware of the false doctrines. You can't beware of the false doctrines if you're not able to discern what they are and where they are and who's preaching them. I can't just sit here and give you a list of, you know, who's preaching this and avoid all this. I want to be able to lead you in the right de direction so that by the Holy Spirit, you can be aware of who's preaching false doctrines and, you know, false preachers and things like that. You have to be led by the Holy Spirit, not man all the time. You understand? So, we go to Math or Mark chapter 11 verse 18 the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him for they feared him because all the people was astonished at his doctrine so notice when jesus was preaching the truth the scribes and the chief priest were threatened by it they were threatened by it that's very telling you understand because they were afraid that they were going to lose their reputation. They were going to lose their business. That's what a lot of these pastors are doing. They're just running a business. And then when they're threatened, they, they seek to kill you. They seek to shut you up. Just like they did with Jesus. They were based... Jesus was... From the perspective of the, of the Pharisees, Jesus was stealing their business. You understand? And that's why they were threatened. They were like, we need to silence this man. We need to kill him. That's exactly what they did, because they were threatened by him. See, and Satan does the same thing today. You know, sin is expensive. You know, you want to spend money on alcohol, on drugs. You want to spend money on prostitutes. You want to go gambling. You want to do this. You want to go to the movies. You want to... Go spend money on all expensive clothing and name brand stuff and get tattoos and all this stuff. It costs money. But when you get born again, you get delivered from all that stuff. And now Satan and his kingdom are now looking at you as somebody they can't make a profit off of. That's why they don't want people getting born again. You understand, celebrities don't want people to be born again because then they can't make money off them 
Because if you're born again, you stop buying their music. You stop trying to look like them, buying their products. And that's not what they want. They don't want that. They want the masses to be demonically deceived. They just want them to follow and obey them and to just worship them as their idol and their god. Because that's what a lot of people are doing. They're worshiping celebrities as their gods. And Satan has set it up this way. But when you become born again, you're a problem. Because now you're, you, you're worth nothing to them. They can't capitalize on your deceptions that you've been delivered from. You see what I mean? So it's interesting to, to see these things and how it works and how it was even going on back then. Mark 12.38, And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes, which love to go in long clothing, and love salutations in the marketplaces. So here Jesus is giving another warning, and he's saying, Beware of the scribes, which love to go in long clothing. In other words, they loved to look good. They loved all eyes to be on them. They liked to be clean and, you know, all this name brand fancy stuff or whatever. And they loved salutations in the marketplaces. They loved people to look up to them. That's what they liked. You know what that is? That's pride and that's self-righteousness. They liked people coming to them at their feet wanting answers and help and guidance. They felt superior and they liked that feeling. It's, it's a demonic sensational feeling. Very interesting to see how Jesus is pointing this out because they liked to be recognized. Jesus was not a man of reputation. He wasn't looking to be, you know, exalted and all this stuff. He came to bring the truth and to do a job and to fulfill the mission he came to do. But right here we see, it says, Beware of the scribes, which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces. Go into John seven fifteen through 17 And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Now this is a very important passage. Right here, the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? So what they were saying is, how does this man know the scriptures having never sat under a well-known rabbi? You know, or today, people would, some people would be like, well, how do you know the Bible? You didn't go to seminary. You don't know what you're talking about. You weren't properly taught in exegesis and proper hermeneutics and all these things that they, you know, teach in seminary. You don't know Greek and you don't know Hebrew and you should just keep your mouth shut and leave it for people with doctorates and theological educations and things like this. That's basically what's going on cuz they're like, how does this man know the letter so well? He did we don't we don't know of his his formal education. He didn't sit in under any rabbis that we know. So, you see that thing it happens today. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Very important to see that you can be taught by the Holy Spirit. And God will, will lead you to listen to certain people that will help you grow in knowledge and understanding. And the Holy Spirit in you will bear witness on if that is true doctrine or not. And that's what it goes on to say. If a man will do his will, if you do the will of God... You shall know of the sound doctrine and who preaches it, you see, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. A lot of people, they just speak in themselves, speak for themselves and things like this, you know. Jesus said something very interesting along the lines of, you know, I come in my father's name, but you will not receive me. If another man come in his name, him you will receive. And there's... A lot of revelation in that and it's very good to see that see these things and realize what's being relayed here in Acts chapter 2 verse 42 this is after Peter preached his first sermon and there was you know 3,000 people that got saved but it goes on to say you know after Peter's sermon 
they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So they didn't just hear it and then go about their business back to their regular lives. They heard it, were changed, were born again, they were saved, and they continued steadfastly. They remained in the apostles' doctrine. They stayed with it, and they held fast to it, and they fellowshiped, and they were breaking bread together and praying together, and that's how it should be. When you hear good doctrine, you have to be steadfast with it and remain in it, and you have to be in fellowship with it, or with people who are in line with it, because we're to be of one mind, and things like that. And so it's interesting, they were breaking bread, eating together, praying together, because they were all, they all believed the same thing. They all had the truth. And that's why they continued in that sound doctrine. Now let's look at Acts chapter 13, verse 6 through 12. It says, And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Par Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God, but Elymas the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation. So Elymas and Bar-Jesus, they're the same person, and this guy was with the deputy of the country who wanted to hear the word of God. And so this guy was calling for Barnabas and Saul, who is Paul, and wanting he wanted to hear you know, the word of God or wanted to hear the gospel, basically. And this guy that was with him, it says, you know, Bar-Jesus, he was with the deputy. He didn't want that. So it goes on to say, but Elymas the sorcerer, withstood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. This is exactly what the devil does and the, the, the devil will use people to make this happen. And you have to look at this passage yourself. I would encourage you. And it says, Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, Many Christians today would be like, that's judging. That's, that's not righteous. That's not Christ-like. Right here, Paul is judging, calling someone a child of the devil. And yet Christians today would condemn me if I said that to them. If I called somebody a child of the devil, enemy of all righteousness, people would be like, that's judgmental. Many Christians, professing Christians would say that's judgmental. Yet here it is in the Bible, Paul's doing it. It says, he said he was filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished. Remember what we lear learned earlier about they were astonished at his doctrine? He spoke with authority and power. And now they were, this guy is astonished at Paul, at the doctrine of the Lord. So notice the doctrine of the Lord goes hand in hand with the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's amazing that Paul was able to look at him and basically pronounced a curse of blindness over him, and God did it. God moved on Paul's behalf, because this man was trying to stop another individual from coming to the faith, and from getting saved and believing in Christ. Because it says right there, he was looking to turn the deputy away from the faith. It says it right there. Paul knew this, called him a child of the devil, and cursed him on the spot with blindness, and God moved and blinded him and the deputy saw everything that happened and he saw the power of God and he was astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. That whole thing is, was considered doctrine. Yet Paul wasn't there teaching him actual doctrine. Paul was there speaking on behalf of God and God moved. You see what happened? That's profound and that's amazing. God removed the obstacle 
that was in the way of somebody getting saved. And it was all because Paul moved with faith and with power and assurance of what he believed. He knew what he believed. That's why he wasn't afraid to speak out in faith and know that God was going to move. That's amazing. That's, that's a level I want to get to. Not because I want to make people blind, but because I want to have that level of faith and assurance and just just anointing, you know what I mean? And it was just amazing to see that. It was very powerful. Let's move on to Romans chapter 6, verse 16 through 18. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were, past tense, the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart. Remember what I talked about earlier about the importance of having a love for the truth. A really deep, sincere love for the truth. It's so important. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. This goes back to the fact that the doctrine you hear and listen to and follow should be producing a change in you. A change from serving sin to now yielding your members unto righteousness and obedience unto righteousness. You see, doing righteousness. Romans 16, 17, Now I'll beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. This is another one of those scriptures where it's just plainly saying to avoid those who are teaching contrary to basically what the Lord teaches you, what the Bible says. You understand? But this again comes back to the importance of having discernment because many people will use the Bible deceitfully and twist it to their own destruction and lead many people astray and seduce many people by preaching to their lusts and not preaching to save them. You see, there's a huge difference. Many people will teach and preach to people's lusts in order to get something from it. The Bible calls it, they're doing it for filthy lucre's sake. And so, instead of preaching to save them, they're preaching to get rich off them. Or they're preaching to rule over them, like Jesus hates, as he says in, in Revelation, which we'll look at later as we get to it. But it's interesting, you have to have that discernment in order to be able to recognize them and avoid them. You can't avoid somebody if you don't have the discernment to realize you need to avoid them. You see what I mean? This is why you have to remain in the Word yourself and seek God in your own private time. It's so important, guys. 1 Corinthians 14, 6. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. Now, I bring up this scripture because there's many Pentecostal churches that will just go into speaking in tongues. And everybody speaking in tongues, it's very unorganized, it's very unorderly. And I believe that speaking in tongues is a gift for today and that it is genuine. But I also believe that Satan counterfeits it. That many churches are in error practicing it in an unorderly way without interpretation. You got people just blurting out tongues and nobody knows what anybody's saying. It's not edifying. It's demonic. And you need to be able to understand that. And what's being said here in the scripture is that if you're not being edified, it's, it's vanity, basically. It's what I get from it because if somebody's coming up to you and speaking in tongues and all this stuff and praise the Lord, that's utter vanity because it brought nothing to you. You didn't get closer to the Lord because of it. If anything, it was awkward. You did not get edified. You did not receive any revelation unless they came speaking in tongues and then someone interpreted it and then it was a word from you and then it was a revelation and it was edifying. But right here, Paul is saying, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what, what good is it? Unless I speak to you either by revelation 
or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. Meaning, and you need to be edified. That's the, the purpose and that's the goal. You see? The goal isn't to just show off that you can speak in tongues. The goal is for someone to be edified and for them to grow in their own walk. That's the point. So I just wanted to share that. Going to Ephesians 4.14, this is very important, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness. Remember that the serpent was the most subtle beast of all the field. You need to realize that Satan is very crafty, he's very subtle, he's very manipulative, and he can twist the word of God in a very discreet fashion that it's hard to realize that it's you know false doctrine unless you really know the truth. Some of these people in these false belief systems, false religions, or false doctrines, they can be very convincing in their arguments. But you have to always realize not to put your confidence in man. Put your trust in the Lord. Put your trust in His Word. Seek Him diligently. God is a rewarder of those who seek Him diligently and persistently. Do not put your trust and confidence all in man. You will end up in a bad spot. But right there it says, you know, don't be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Some people lie in wait to deceive you intentionally because they're of the devil. And then there's some people who lie in wait to deceive you unknowingly because they're being used by the devil ignorantly. You see, you need to realize there's two different ways that the devil uses somebody. The devil will use somebody who knowingly serves him, and the devil will also use somebody that he has deceived, and they think that they're serving God. Just like it says in, in the Bible, Jesus said there's going to be people who will kill you and think they're doing God a service. Those people are deceived, and, it, and it's very clear because they think they're doing God a service. So you have to be aware of that. But getting tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, I mean, this is so prevalent today. It's so easy to just get sidetracked by something that's not very important. And, you know, people are, you know, worried about, because, you know, be no more children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. You know, oh, Jesus is actually a pagan name and it actually means Hail Zeus and we have to call him Yahawashai and all this stuff I'll do a video on that some other time you know oh oh the earth is actually flat and oh, oh you know and then the black Hebrew Israelites have their doctrine they're preaching to you in the street and then oh well you got Calvinist and Arminians coming against each other and then you got the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses knocking on your door different doctrines are being preached you turn on your TV it's prosperity doctrine coming at you you got people telling you the gifts have ceased. You got people telling you you got to keep the law of Moses. You got the Baptist doctrine. You got the Presbyterian doctrine. You got the Methodist doctrine, the Seventh day Adventist doctrine, and the Catholic doctrine. And, you know, you're getting tossed to and fro all these different things. And it's just like boom, boom, boom. You're getting bombarded. And what the devil is doing is he's trying to toss you. And why is he trying to do that? Because he doesn't want you to get rooted in Christ. It's very simple. All these things are coming at you and you're getting thrown about. And Jesus, when he was in the boat with his disciples, they were getting thrown by the sea and they say, Master, don't you care that we perish? And he's just like, how is it you have no faith? And then he spoke to the storms and said, be still. See, what needs to be understood is that you have to be rooted in Christ if you are to not be moved, you're not supposed to be moved. You realize that? That's why it says, don't be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine because they're going to come. People are going to come with different doctrines, different religions and all, you know, so, so, much, so much information. I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what to believe. The devil's doing that intentionally to keep you, to keep you distracted from getting rooted in Christ and just seeking Him and believing His Word. It's so simple. You can follow Jesus and believe His Word and not be tied to some denomination or tied to some belief system. 
you can actually follow Christ and believe the Bible and not call yourself a Calvinist or a Baptist or a Catholic. And you need to be delivered from all that stuff because it's doctrines of devils. It's doctrines of devils. Why do you think there's so many of them? They're overwhelming. It's everywhere, guys. And the point that the devil is trying to do, what he's trying to do is, is destroy you and break your faith and keep you from growing in Christ and being conformed to his, to his image. You understand? It's about Christ being formed in you. That's what it's all about, guys. You have to be changed from the inside out. Your nature has to be changed. You have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Offering your body as a living sacrifice so that the Holy Spirit can take residence in you and then use you as a vessel fit for the Master's use. A vessel of honor. The devil doesn't want that. So what he's going to do is throw kinds of different, all kinds of different doctrine at you to get you to be led astray. Next thing you know, you're in a seminary somewhere priding, being prideful about your Calvinist views and now you're some scholar because you want to be recognized as something great. All that's not necessary. Go somewhere, deny yourself, seek God alone, read His Word like a child without all these preconceived doctrines and belief systems that are being thrown at you and let the Lord teach you and show you something. You see? It's just so important, guys. Moving on to 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 6. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. The Holy Spirit is speaking directly. There is no, no misunderstanding what's being said next. That in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, you cannot depart from something you were not in. It says they depart from the faith. You can't depart from something you were not a part of. You understand? The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed, giving heed, they listen to, they entertain, seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. How does a seducing spirit seduce you? They appeal to your lust. They appeal to anything they can get to. And they will probe you and see. See, like, all, a lot of these black people are giving heed to this black Hebrew Israelite doctrine. What's going on is the demons are probing these people and finding out they have, you know, black pride or self-righteousness. And so they appeal to that. And they make a doctrine. The demons make a doctrine that will appeal to that area, to that weakness they have, and exploit it. Next thing you know, they're dressing in all kinds of crazy outfits, yelling at you in the street, and all this stuff. And they were seduced. They were seduced by seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Demons create many doctrines. You understand? And they seduce you by looking at your weaknesses. Are you self-righteous? Oh yeah? Well, I'm going to actually tell you we're under the law of Moses. That's a doctrine of devils, telling somebody you're still under the law of Moses. You got all these so-called Christians trying to keep the law of Moses, and what happens? What happened was they were seduced by a doctrine of a devil, and the devil got in through their self-righteousness. That's all it is, guys. That's all it is. And so they'll probe you. You got pride, you got self-righteousness, you know, you got you got money issues or you got greed or something like that. Or they'll exploit anything they can in order to feed you a doctrine of devils, one of their doctrines. You understand? To lead you astray and then they will use you to open your mouth to lead others astray. That's how it works, guys. And it goes on to explain, you know, you read the rest of the passage you know, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. It goes on to explain many other things, like the Catholic Church. It goes on to also say, speaking lies and hypocrisy. That's just like the Pharisees. You know, they would tell you to do something, but they themselves wouldn't do it. Like Jesus said, you know, whatever they tell you do, but, 
you know, they won't lift a finger, you know, says something along those lines. And they will speak lies and hypocrisy. That's just so dangerous, guys. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. They no longer care what, what's right and wrong. It's all about their gain. They're just speaking lies and hypocrisy and all this stuff, guys. And look what goes on to say next. Forbidding to marry. Forbidding to marry. What do you have in the Catholic Church? Clerical celibacy. Priests are not allowed to marry. They're not allowed to be married. If you're a man and you want to be a priest in the Catholic Church, you cannot be married. And right here, the Bible says that is a doctrine of devils, blatantly. And yet people, Catholics, can't see it. Some will see it, and they will come out of that church. And commanding to abstain from meats. This is another aspect of the Catholic Church. Seventh-day Adventists also will do this, and, you know, law keepers, and, oh, you can't eat this, you can't eat that. You know, black Hebrew Israelites do the same thing because they keep the law of Moses. And, um, you know, it's just crazy. But this is also a Catholic Church. What they do is they'll tell you to abstain from meat on Ash Wednesday, uh, Good Friday, and the Friday of Lent. You know, Lent is that one celebration. You'll see people with that little black ash on their forehead. It's just ridiculous, guys. It's completely ridiculous. None of that is in Scripture. It's all pagan tradition and foolishness. And right here we see it's just a doctrine of devils. Which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Notice how the truth sets you free, but doctrines of devils... They constrain and they bind you. They bind you to rules and this and that. And, and don't get me wrong, there are do's and don'ts, but they're not binding. They're liberating in Christ. You see, there is a major difference. When you are really set free by the Son of God, you are not bound anymore. You are really set free. And you take pleasure in righteousness because you realized that you were a slave to sin. Sin binds you. Don't you see that? Sin binds you. And that's exactly what doctrines of devils are designed to do. They're designed to bind you. If you're feeling bound and you're feeling constrained, that's not good. Something's not right there. And it goes on to say, For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Period. Nothing. You know, Jesus also said, eat whatever is set before you. Paul said it too. So if somebody sets some bacon before you and you're witnessing to them and you don't want to offend them, you're to eat it. You're to eat it. Would you eat crickets with John the Baptist in order to not offend him? Or would you try to say you're more righteous than him? And, oh, no, I can't eat crickets. You know, that's unclean. Yet Jesus called John the Baptist the greatest man to be born. You see how religion can just completely pollute and just distort your perception of truth and reality? It's crazy. People that are religious are just very bound in, in many ways and sometimes they can't even see it. So you have to be aware of that. And it says, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. I've seen somebody use this scripture and then go back to the Old Testament. See, so says, the word of God says this is what's clean. And it's like, no, man, you're in a different covenant on that. If thou put in the, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. So notice the doctrines of devils. Some of them are even laid out for you and... They fit the Catholic Church perfectly, and if you understand that and you can be delivered from that and teach the truth of that, then you'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. Good doctrine, which does not bind you, it liberates and sets you free. Whereunto thou hast attained. Verse 13 Paul goes on to tell Timothy, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Emphasizing the importance of studying. Just like it says in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show yourself approved unto God. You have to do it. You have to give 
attendance to these things. You have to put forth the effort into these things. If you are going to be able to discern sound doctrine so that you can know the truth and grow in it, then you need to be able to attend and sacrifice the time necessary in order to study and read. Verse 16 says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt save both thyself and them that hear thee. What do you mean, Paul? You can save yourself? See, you need to also understand the context because, as I mentioned earlier, if you give heed to the wrong thing, you will damn yourself. You will damn yourself. So you have to be careful. That's why Paul's telling Timothy, give attendance to reading. Study to show yourself approved. Stir up the gift that was, that was given to you. You need to do these things so that you are not deceived by yourself or by somebody else. Take heed that no man deceive you. The only way they can deceive you is if they seduce you with doctrines of devils. The only thing that will steer you clear of that is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. You need to get full of the Holy Spirit, guys. 1 Timothy 1, 9 through 10, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinner, and for the sinner, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So notice all these things that were listed are contrary to sound doctrine. Someone who is ungodly and a sinner, they're contrary to sound doctrine. If you want to, if you want to follow sound doctrine, you have to turn from your ungodly sinful ways. You, ha you have to turn from the unholy and profane things. You understand? Because those things are contrary to sound doctrine. It's very important to see that. It's very plain. 1 Timothy 5.17, let the elders that rule be, that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. So if an elder is doing well and they're ruling properly, let them be worthy of double honor. And then it goes on to say, to say especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Notice, you have to labor in it. Much study is a weariness of the flesh, as it says in, in the Bible. I believe that's in Ecclesiastes. Much study is a weary of the flesh. It's weary, it's, it's difficult, but you have to do it. It's a lot of time. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of persistence, but you have to do it. You have to labor in the Word. Search the Scriptures, study it, show yourself approved unto God, and then you will have good success. 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 5, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Now let me point something out. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying, anyone who teaches you not to consent, or listen, or follow the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, He's saying they're proud, they know nothing, and all this stuff. Now, there are some people who teach this doctrine called dispensationalism, which I used to believe, and I'm not going to say it's not good to understand it. It is, you know, helpful to understand what it is and all that stuff. But there are people who they will take this doctrine of dispensationalism and then they will begin to teach that Paul taught a different gospel than Jesus Christ. That is heresy. That is heresy, guys. Now, they will use scriptures to try to, to make that fit. But this one says right here, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christians today are to follow the words of Jesus Christ when understood in its proper context. That's what rightly dividing the word means. People think that means dispensationalism. No, it means keeping things in its proper context based upon the period of time it's going on and all this stuff based upon the covenant it's in. You see, you need to realize Jesus Christ is the new covenant. But 
some people they they get seduced with their pride of knowledge and things like this and they have such great understanding of the word and so they are authorities on the matter but you need to realize that guys anybody who teaches not to listen to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness says he is proud knowing nothing but dotting about questions and strifes of words whereof cometh envy strife railings which is exactly what will happen if you argue with somebody who has a different belief than yours evil surmisings perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds says and destitute of the truth it does no good arguing back and forth with somebody who's not willing to be corrected or they're not willing to admit they could be wrong or misunderstood something it says supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself I would encourage you to study that passage on your own time and that way you can recognize these things these perverse disputings of men with corrupt minds it's it's sad to see two people arguing and both of them are wrong it's very sad to see that and the Bible says withdraw yourself from that withdraw yourself because it's a waste of time and they're arguing over doctrine of vanities you need to be able to discern that so that your time isn't wasted by the devil the devil would love nothing more than to waste your whole day arguing with one of his servants arguing over something that isn't even that important worried and studying about something that doesn't even get you closer to the Lord the devil loves nothing more than these things it's what he does he will get people to try to waste your time and argue with you all day long and all night and all the next day and they won't stop Satan will consume your time and he will take your life if you let him 2nd Timothy 310 but thou hast fully known my doctrine manner of life purpose faith long-suffering charity patience persecutions afflictions etc I read that scripture because you're not supposed to only have sound doctrine alone you're supposed to have sound doctrine and that should help you conduct a righteous manner of life it gives you purpose gives you faith and it produces long suffering which is a fruit of the Holy Spirit charity and patience and it will help you endure persecutions and afflictions see how essential sound doctrine is it connects to all these different things that are important in your walk with the Lord Titus chapter 2 verse 7 through 8 and all things showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine notice good works and doctrine are going hand in hand you can't do good works if you don't have good doctrine if you have bad doctrine you'll do good works in vain didn't Jesus say that Many will go to him and say, haven't we done all these wonderful things? Jesus, say, Jesus will say, I never knew you. They had bad doctrine. They didn't have a real relationship with the Lord. They had good, you know, works, but they had bad doctrine and that produced bad motives. Corrupt motives. Self-centered motives. Self-righteous motives of wanting to be seen like the Pharisees. Wanting to be praised in the marketplaces. Wanting to be recognized for your status that's ungodly that's a wrong motive and that comes from wrong doctrine in all things showing thyself a pattern a persistent ongoing pattern of good works in doctrine showing uncorruptness gravity sincerity you can't be sincere if you have bad doctrine because your motives will be perverse you can't do good works just to make your, yourself feel good. You have to do good things because it's really in your nature to do those good things. Don't just help somebody just because you want to say you help somebody. Do it because you sincerely want to help them. God will not be fooled by your motives. He knows them. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil thing to say of you wouldn't that be great to be able to conduct yourself righteously in every area of your life even at work or at school 
to the point where nobody can say anything wrong about you. They can't say that you lied about somebody. They can't say that all oh, you you cuss and you. They can't say that all oh, you get angry too, just like us, and you blow up and have rages. Wouldn't that be nice that people look at you and they're like, you know, I can't say anything bad about him. He's he's nice. He's caring. He's respectful. He has good manners. Smart. That's a good witness. You understand? Has a, he has a good work ethic. He comes to work every day on time. He doesn't miss. He's not lazy. He does a good job. That's what you want. Says that he is of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil thing to say of you. That's how it should be. You should not give other people ammunition to, to shoot you with. You know what I mean? You shouldn't give them reasons to come against you. Titus 1, 9 through 11. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers. Remember, doctrine of vanities. And deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses. They don't just subvert one person, they subvert whole households. Teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Their motive was getting money. A lot of these preachers, they're teaching and preaching things that make you feel good because they're after your money. Turn on your TV and put it on the televangelist channel. And listen to Joel Osteen, you'll see exactly what I mean. All these people, they're after the bottom dollar. That's what they want. They don't care about you. They don't know you. They're not concerned about your problems. They don't care if you gave them your last dollar. They're not going to pray for you. They're not going to baptize you. They're not going to spend one-on-one -on -one time with you. They're not going to even answer you. They're going to have one of their other people send you an automated email or something thanking you. And then trying to get you to buy more stuff. It's so evil, guys. You have to be aware of that. Moving on to 2 John, verse 9 through 11. Whosoever transgresseth, transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, notice talking about the doctrine of Christ, doesn't say the doctrine of Paul, because they taught the same thing. Paul, Jesus, Peter, they taught the same thing, the same gospel. Who abideth. Whoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed, for he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Because they don't have discernment. And they don't abide in the doctrine of Christ. Jesus said, if any man abide in me, he will bring forth much fruit. That's what, what he teaches. But you have to abide, stay in him, remain steadfast. You see, Revelation 2, 14 and 15, this will be the last scripture and I'll wrap it up. But I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. You can read about this in the book of Numbers, chapter 22 through 24. But basically, Balaam was teaching Balak to cast a stumbling block to the children of Israel, basically getting them to practice like sexual immorality or eating things sacrificed to idols, idolatry, things like that. And Jesus is saying to this church, this is one of the churches, in Revelation, says, you know, you have there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak, so now he's using this as an example, to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Uh, the Catholic Church does this. They call it transubstantiation, where the priest takes the bread and the wine for communion or mass or whatever, and they say a prayer, and then they act as if it's literally the body and blood of Christ. 
and they will use scriptures and take it out of its context and apply a literal meaning to them, which is not intended if you read the context. And they are basically practicing cannibalism and they're basically saying that Jesus Christ has returned, even though the Bible says that he's only going to return the same way he left. You understand? But yet they're saying, no, he returned. Forget what the Bible says. He's returning right now in the form of bread and wine. And you eat it, and you're eating Christ and drinking his blood. Literally. They literally believe that it's not figurative. You understand? That's called transubstantiation, and it's an abomination. And Jesus Christ is warning a church for doing this. I wonder what church he's talking to. You know what I mean? And to commit fornication, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Which thing I hate. Jesus hates the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. That word comes from Nico, prevail or rule over. And then it comes from the laity, which means common people. So the Nicolaitans ruled over the common people, just like the priest and the pope. They rule over. What they say goes. Same with many other preachers. They like to rule over the people. Peter warned against this stuff. About lording over God's heritage. Being lords over God's heritage. That's not a good thing. That's looked down upon. You understand? And Jesus is saying, I hate these people who lord themselves over my people. Over my sheep. You understand? And you need to realize that. And there's people who's teaching this doctrine of transubstantiation. And notice how in this passage, that bad doctrine led to basically idolatry, ties to idolatry, eating food, sacrifice to idols, and immorality. Bad doctrine will always lead to bad conduct every single time. Whether it's sexual immorality, whether it's idolatry in your heart, any kind of thing. Bad doctrine will always lead to bad conduct, and you're in a dangerous spot if that's the case. So guys, I hope that video was helpful in different areas, but I hope it was helpful for you to take doctrine more seriously, and not just be willing to listen to anything and everything. You have to t try the spirits, see whether they are of God, you have to study the scriptures to see if what you're being taught is in line with the Word of God. But most importantly, the number one way to discern sound doctrine is to look at how it's affecting you and your walk with the Lord. Are you becoming more bold to witness to people? Are you becoming closer to the Lord? Are you being able to understand the Word better? Are you getting closer to God in your prayer life? Are you becoming more righteous and yielding your members to righteousness and not to sin? Are you being delivered from sin? Demonic strongholds? You understand, guys? That's how you're one of the best ways to be able to discern sound doctrine. It will produce good fruit in you. So I hope that video was helpful, guys. It went on kind of long, but hey, you know, I hope it was beneficial to you. If you have any questions, you know, contact me. I'll get back to you when I can. Otherwise, be blessed in Jesus Christ's mighty name, guys, and I'll talk to you next time.